Welcome to Culture Street. Today I'm talking with Kate Morton, the author of The Shifting Fog, also known as The House at Riverton, The Forgotten Garden, The Distant Hours, and most recently, The Secret Keeper. Um, well, welcome. Thank you very much. Your books have, uh, your four books have sold all over the world, uh, millions of copies. What's your secret? <laughs> Uh, many secrets, a keeper right. of many. Um, honestly, I think people like to be told stories. I think it's innate. I think ever since we're, you know, we're children and, and humans going back across generations have always loved to be told stories that they can disappear inside, you know, sort of down the rabbit hole, mm -hmm. get lost I inside the world of the book. And, you know, sometimes people comment to me that my stories are old fashioned. And I think that's what they're saying. I, I think perhaps that slipped out of vogue but that people's that's what people still enjoy is to disappear and go somewhere else mm -hmm. well your books are often set um in past time and the secret keeper is is one of those books um a lot of it is set to the backdrop of the blitz the london blitz yes how did you do your research to, <laughs> because your the sense of time and place in the book is is remarkable oh thank you that was really important to me um blitz time london is one of those historical periods that i had such a keen interest in as a person um more so than as a writer and i'd wanted to put it into one of my books for such a long time but I, I held off because I was really worried that because it was important to me and because I spent so much time uh, immersed in that world for pleasure, that I would somehow do it a disservice when I tried to render it into my fiction. So I uh, went to London in 2008 and I was really fortunate because I was able to be there for three months with my husband and my boys. And uh, while I was there, for not, not even thinking about um, a book, I started to read as many books as I could find set in the period. I went to the Imperial War Museum, but I still wanted more. Uh, so I uh, looked on the internet and I found a fellow called Clive who was offering uh, walking tours of Blitz Time London. And I arranged to meet him on the corner of Speaker's Corner. Oh, yes. And yes. he said, you'll know me, I'll be wearing a red carnation in my pocket. And so I oh. thought, okay. <laughs> and I went and I took my sister and my husband with me and we met Clive and he was just amazing. Uh, we spent this blustery cold November day uh, wandering through Mayfair and at one point he pointed up to the side of um, a building, one of those Edwardian brick painted white buildings and he said have a look up there and we did and there was the ghosted S and an arrow from a shelter sign wow. pointing down the external stairs and you know I just love that, that sort of living history. You know, I could immediately see people rushing down and, and the, um, hear the air raid siren and feel that sort of fear that must have been in the air as the searchlights were waving about. And, and for me, uh, it made it real. And so it was sort of after that that I finally felt ready to put it into fiction. Right. I noticed that you, you acknowledge Clive in your book. I do. As, uh, as a source of, of a lot of your information. Yeah, because he brought that world to life. And more than that, when I was actually writing and had come up with the story, I had to send him off a few emails because he's such an expert on all things to do with um, the Second World War yeah. and I was very lucky to have someone like that to answer my little queries. So what were a couple of things that he helped out when you were oh, through the writing process? There are so many that the little things that you have to ask because you know you can do research for the obvious big things you know what was on what was rationed at the time mm -hmm. but it's little things like uh, one thing that comes to mind at one point uh, I have uh, a postage stamp become sort of important in the story and I thought well I'll, I'll you know put one of those postmarks on like we have here where it says when and where it was sent from yeah. and then I thought well did they have them then I'm not sure and it's such a tiny point but it that was one of the largest research um queries I had you know I had to Gosh, snake through so many people to find out what might have been on a letter at the time yeah, so. yeah. oh very good <laughs> uh, the the book begins with uh, quite a dramatic opening scene um, which is really pivotal to the whole book you go backwards and forwards in time from that moment was that always going to come first that scene yeah it was it it's a uh, 
I, I had a few, I always think that the idea for a book, uh, there are so many little ideas that make up the whole book, but you only need a few of them at the very beginning to come together to form the kernel of what will become that novel. And the uh, girl sitting up the top of the tree, which is, you know, that's the person who opens the book, who looks through uh, her old childhood uh, treehouse window and witnesses something shocking, was with me from the very start. It took me a little while to work out exactly what it was she saw but I had her for years and years I tried to force her into other books but she wouldn't right. wouldn't fit because funnily enough she didn't belong there mm, so but, it worked well here. yeah and I, I really wanted the first chapter to work almost as a separate little vignette that you could read as a, a, a complete uh, story that's discreet almost from the rest of the book. I mean, it's the only chapter set in 1961, mm -hmm. and I wanted it to go from this really beautiful, idyllic, summery, uh, English countryside type day and end up somewhere really dramatically different by the end of the chapter. And so it was actually a lot of fun to write. And was that the first it part was. that you wrote? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the... Uh, most predominantly most of the book is set in the UK and yes. you obviously have this fascination with the UK and particularly history yeah. but you do manage to get Tambourine Mountain <laughs> which I think is your childhood home yes it is um, in a very small chapter very yes. briefly in yes. the book was that important to you yes it was because I mean as you say I've set most of my books in England and I think that is probably because uh, as a writer I like to go somewhere else in the same way I want to transport readers and you know I don't need to write about a, a woman in her 30s in Brisbane in the present day because that's my life mm -hmm. and I live it you know so for me to enjoy what I'm doing I, I go somewhere different uh, but the older I get the, the stronger the pull uh, to write about my own experiences and my own childhood in particular um, I think it's it does imprint differently you know I, I think um, I wrote about that in the book, the idea that the place you grow up in, your senses are different as a child and it's a very visceral sort of memory. And so I really wanted to put my home, which is the, you know, the subtropical rainforest of Tambourine mm -hmm. Mountain in southeast Queensland, into a book. And especially knowing that I have readers uh, around the world who perhaps will never uh, be able to experience for themselves what it's like in my neck of the woods, it was great to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, as you say, is a beautiful part it is um, and it's a lovely part of the book as well how was that easier to write than all the historical British yeah um, <laughs> it was it was it was a joy uh, it was the easiest it required very little editing and I guess that makes sense you know I I know what it's like um, to to stand on the veranda of an old Queenslander and, and wait for a storm that's mm -hmm. been building all day you know I, I know that beneath my skin what that feels like so to write about it was was really quite easy you know that I grew up in a very similar um, situation to my character Vivian in that our house when I was small was right on the edge of the escarpment where the rainforest sort of fell away mm -hmm. and we would frequently you know run through the bush and jump over branches and skid over leaves and, and jump on rocks in the creek where the waterfall ran mm -hmm. so that was very much a window into my own um, childhood experience. Mm -hmm. The I presume it's Vivian on the front cover is that Vivian is the, the I, I change my mind all the time okay. about who it is right. <laughs> there's so many people have secrets in this book. Okay uh, it, it's. I find it very interesting that there are three different front covers for the book for the UK, the US and yes. Australia and one thing that um, slightly amused me was the fact that the British cover is this beautiful springtime scene yeah. and the Australian cover is quite a wintry uh, scene and they're both released at the same time so springtime as the UK is going into winter <laughs> yes. and for us the opposite was that a particular it, it wasn't, but well, not not from me anyway. Right. I mean, I don't design the jackets, but now I think about it, that's kind of um, suits my whole thing about reading, you know, the idea of stepping into um, a, yeah. a different world and going somewhere else. Yeah. Perhaps that's what we look for when it's sweltering in Australia. Yeah. It's nice to go somewhere a bit cool and dark, whereas, you know, with an English winter to look forward to, it's nice to pick something up that's got Absolutely. beautiful springtime. I just looked at it and thought, gosh, all those people going through the UK winter would look at this and think, oh, <laughs> You just love me to read now. <laughs> That's Kenny. I yes. like it. <laughs> well, congratulations. It's a, a fabulous book. Thank you. Um, 
one last question. I yes. know that recently it's been announced that one of your other books, yes. The Forgotten Garden, has um, film rights have been sold to Clint Eastwood's company, I think it is. To, to Robert Lorenz, who was, uh, is Clint Eastwood, works with Clint Eastwood. Right. Yeah. Will you be involved in, in <laughs> the screen, uh, in the screenwriting for that? I'm or? not sure. I've heard they oh. often bar writers from, you know, okay. being on set of, the, you know, any uh, films that are made of their books. And it's a funny thing, and I may, I reserve the right to change my mind completely, but at this point, you know, I love books, I love words, I love uh, capturing ideas on paper. So for me, the end of, the, the end point of all my dreaming and imagining is the book. So for me, The Forgotten Garden is, is finished. And you know, the funny thing about being the sort of writer who finishes one book and then wants to move on into the next is that it's like being inside a bubble when I'm working on the book I'm right in that world and then the moment it goes off and is published the bubble seals and it drifts away and I move in a different direction and I couldn't get back into that world if if I had to mm -hmm. so it's almost like it, it's okay for me to pass that on to somebody else to mm -hmm. turn it into a different um, kind of creative entity well, all your books and The Secret Keeper included will relate very well on screen. They're very visual books, all of them. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think as people, you know, living in the here and now, we are all soaked in, in the visual world, you know, the, the world of film and television. And, and I certainly see it that way when I'm writing. You know, I can I, I can see it in my mind that we'll have the long shot of the car coming up the windy driveway and then the close-up of the door slamming and then the person walking and then the hand on the door. And I think a lot of us see things that way um, because so much of our um, storytelling literacy comes from the world of film. Yeah. And have you started working on your next book? <laughs> I have, in fact, okay. with the very creative title of book number five right. at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with all the words that go in the middle of the book, but those three that have to go on the front are just so difficult for really? me. Yes. Is that so, the last thing for you, the title? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is very close to last. Uh, or I'll have one that, you know, I think is fine, like The Secret Keeper. I called the birthday party in my mind for a long time oh, okay. until everybody uh, in publishing who I mentioned it to went, hmm... I don't know. <laughs> well, but the Secret Keeper is the perfect title for the book. It really thank you. Tells, Better tells than the, the birthday story. party. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little more mysterious. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's really an intriguing story and keeps you guessing right up until the end with all these beautiful historical themes in it as well. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you so it much. Was very enjoyable. Thank you very much for joining Absolute us. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs>